Hello, and welcome to Shelf Life, featuring The Silent Shore with Charles L. Chavis, Jr. I'm Jane Kulo, director of Virginia's Center for the Book, a program at Virginia Humanities. We are pleased to co-host this event with the Maryland Center for the Book at Maryland Humanities. As neighboring humanities councils, we share a mission to amplify stories that many folks don't know about. I'll share a couple of housekeeping notes. Please share your questions using the Q&A tab on Zoom. This event has optional closed captioning, which you can turn on and customize at any time during the event using the closed captions tab at the bottom of your window. If you haven't already read today's book, we hope you will. For details about how to buy it, visit vabook.org, where you can also explore our schedule of upcoming events and watch past events. We appreciate the support of our community partners for helping to share information about this event. Those include the History of Lynching in Virginia Work Group of the Virginia Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Memorial Commission, the John Mitchell Jr. Program for History, Justice, and Race at the Jimmy and Rosalind Carter School for Peace and Conflict Resolution at George Mason University, the Racial Terror Lynching in Virginia Project in the Department of Justice Studies at James Madison University. We also want to thank Ting for supporting our virtual programming. Lindsay? Hi, everyone. I'm Lindsay Baker, Executive Director of Maryland Humanities, and we are especially pleased to co-host this event with Virginia Humanities. In The Silent Shore, Dr. Chavis draws on his discovery of previously unreleased investigative documents to meticulously reconstruct the full story of one of the last lynchings in Maryland, that of Matthew Williams in 1931. The Silent Shore explores the immediate and lingering effects of Williams' death on the politics of racism in the United States. And now I'm pleased to introduce our speakers. Charles L. Chavis, Jr., author of The Silent Shore, The Lynching of Matthew Williams and the Politics of Racism in the Free State, is the founding director of the John Mitchell Jr. Program for History, Justice, and Race at George Mason University's Jim, Jimmy and Rosalind Carter School for Peace and Conflict Resolution, where he is also an assistant professor of conflict analysis and resolution and history. Chavis is national co-chair for the United States Truth, Racial Healing, and Transformation Movement and the vice chair of the Maryland Lynching Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Maya Davis is the director of the Riversdale House Museum in Prince George's County, Maryland. She currently serves as a commissioner on the Maryland Lynching Truth and Reconciliation Commission and the Maryland Commission, Commission on African American History and Culture. A native Washingtonian, Maya is a graduate of Howard and George Washington Universities, where she obtained degrees in history and museum studies, which I will say are the best degrees. I'm a little biased. Thank you all for joining us today. Charles and Maya, it's over to you. Thank you so much, Lindsay and Jane. It's my pleasure to be here this afternoon. And I wanna to say to our audience, good afternoon and welcome to this Shelf Life virtual event. I'm Maya Davis, and it is my pleasure to share this platform with my friend and colleague, Dr. Charles Chavis, who recently released his new book, The Silent Shore, The Lynching of Matthew Williams and the Politics of Racism in the Free State. This book has been described as the definitive account of the lynching of 23-year-old Matthew Williams in Maryland, and further states that it's the subsequent investigation and the legacy of modern day lynchings. While this event happened 90 years ago, just this past December 4th, the incident is one that many people today can connect with as we grapple with the rise of modern day white supremacy rooted acts of violence against people of color. On a personal note, Dr. Chavis, as I know that you're well aware, I have a 23 year old son. He's a senior at the University of Maryland Eastern Shore and just has a, really a lot in common with a young Matthew Williams. Um, and I really just could not put this book down. Uh, first, because your writing was so compelling. Um, second, to further educate myself and understand the necessity for continued vigilance for my son and the sons of other mothers. And finally, to think about citizen advocacy and reconciliation. 
Um, and before we get started, I really, I have a few questions myself, but I want to remind our audience to make sure that they use the Q&A feature so that I can share with Dr. Chavis your questions. And so before I get to the book specifically, Dr. Chavis, um, I just wanted to ask you, um, why did you decide to tackle the subject of lynching, which is one of our most difficult histories to grapple with, and in particular, focus in on the story of Matthew Williams, who was one of more than 40 lynchings in our state. Please, if you will, just open up and let us know that. Sure, sure. Thank you so much, Maya. Um, um, a dear friend, listen, we are um, partners in crime, right? And yes, doing we are. And work for justice <laughs> um, with this lynching commission. And so thankful for your friendship and for this opportunity to share my work and research with the Maryland um, humanities as well as Virginia humanities. Um, and so to your question, a very common question that I get, you know, why did I choose to talk about lynching? Um, it all started um, when I was a student at Morgan State University, um, another HBCU proud grad. Um, so I did my PhD there in history um, and I began to fi try to figure out what exactly I wanted my topic to be. Um, I really wanted to focus on a legacy of racial violence, right? Around this time, 2014, we're seeing, you know, Freddie Gray, we're seeing all of these things, the emergence of Black Lives Matter with um, the Trevon Martin situation. I recall being a master's student at Vanderbilt University um, and being arrested and startled um, and I actually got, got sick after um, hearing the verdict uh, regarding George Zimmerman, right? And as a historian who's living through this, this current um, these current modern day lynchings, this unrelenting, it seems like it's, it's unrelenting, it never ends. On the screens, we constantly see um, people of color, specifically black men and women who are dying at the hands of the police and others. And um, for me as a historian, I sought to look and examine the ways in which um, lynchings can, in understanding historical, um, the historical practice of lynching can inform how we deal with and how we grapple with and understand modern day forms of lynching. Um, and I think it's also important to dispel this myth that is out there regarding um, the ways in which, you know, our country should um, co compartmentalize lynching, right, as a historical phenomenon. We have to be able to see lynching as um, a part of a continuation of anti-Black violence and terror that we continue to see um, to this day. Um, and so I was really inspired um, specifically um, around the cases of um, Freddie Gray, as well as the cases of Anton Black on Maryland's Eastern Shore. These modern day forms of lynching, these cases caused me to think about the ways in which we can utilize history to, under to begin to un understand and unravel and to make sense of the trauma that black communities throughout this country continue to face, not something that has just emerged in the age of Black Lives Matter. Thank you. Um, you know, just always a compelling story. We have our own personal chats over the phone in person, um, and you always have me thinking. And so as I looked at and read the book, because I'm definitely one of those people where I'm looking at the cover as much as I'm looking at the content. Um, so I really want to start with that. Um, and just wondering like how you decided to choose the cover for this book. Um, as you know, we've kind of both had a lot of discussion around our, the reintroduction of trauma related to images that we've seen associated with the lynching of black bodies. And your cover of this book opted to highlight the mob the scene of the mob that were there and not really reintroduce trauma in that way. How did you decide that this would be the cover of this book? And what was your motivation behind that? Well, thank you so much, Maya, for that question. I think the question concerning the trauma, we talk about all of this a lot. Me and you spent a lot of time on dealing with this and how we're going to think about developing the hearings for the commission, um, specifically in regards to reintroducing this trauma through these very um, visceral and traumatic images. You know, there's um, already exhibits um, historically as well as publications that highlight photographs of another ephemera pertaining to lynching. Um, and I felt that, you know, those works did an amazing job of um, displaying um, and teasing out and dealing with these images and the trauma associated with them, including the late Congressman um, John Lewis's work around the Without Sanctuary exhibit. 
Um, but what I wanted to do in this book um, and in working with my um, publishers at John Hopkins, as well as a number of colleagues at various archives throughout the state, um, I wrote and, and connecting also with the descendants of Matthew Williams, I wanted to find a photograph that um, figuratively dispelled this myth, right? Um, in the way that John Lewis does in his work in terms of displaying the actual people who are there, right? Because what we were dealing with um, as, you know, as black people in this country, specifically in regards to our history, the direct assault on our history is that these um, lies are told regarding the history of lynching, um, specifically one of the tropes that is often um, recounted, even in investigative documents, but also even to this day, is that these lynchings took place at the hands of persons unknown, right? Which we know in terms of the black community, but also, as my book reveals, the white community, the white political leaders, and all those involved in lynching knew exactly who was involved. This image puts it out um, for all to see that indeed um, there were people there who knew about it and they um, didn't seek to even try and cover up their crime because they took a photograph, right? That speaks to the way, how confident um, and how the strength of white supremacy regarding, um, even if you have uh, photographic evidence of being at a crime, um, just that you had, to, you had not need to worry about the killing of a black man or um, violence towards a black community because justice did not work for them the way in which it um, works for others, right? So it's interesting in that regard, but this is actually not even an image of the scene, the lynching of Matthew Williams. This is a um, scene from 1898, the lynching of William Andrews that I was able to track down and hunt, um, track down with the support of um, the NAB Center. The NAB Center actually um, at Salisbury University, I discovered this um, going through their materials and working with their um, regional archivist, um, Ian Post. And we decided to go with this image instead of the more popular image um, from the Baltimore Sun, the cartoon figure um, that is displayed um, um, within the book as well um, by the Pulitzer Prize winning cartoonist um, for the Baltimore Sun. We decided to go with this one because, again, it speaks to um, the ways in which lynching is just not um, we talk about this is one case, I try to tell people, this is one case of over 6,500 potential cases around this nation, right? And so um, this image speaks not only for Matthew Williams, but it also speaks to the, those thousands and the thousands upon thousands of people, white people who were there and present and in many ways did nothing. Thank you so much for that. Um, one of the aspects of your book that I think has made this text so powerful are the personal vignettes um, of individuals and places on the Eastern Shore that kind of help set the stage for the events that took place leading up to the lynching of Matthew Williams. And um, one of the ones that spoke to me was that of James Stewart. And I'm going to read a brief passage uh, really quickly, and then we can kind of get into that further. I have my copy of your book here. <laughs> I'm happy to have it. And in the book, you say, the signature Black institution on Broad Street in Georgetown was John Wesley United Methodist Church, the church where Matthew Williams was a member. Today is the only remaining building from the original Georgetown neighborhood. Across the street from the church were the home and business of James E. Stewart, the area's black undertaker and funeral home director. He had started his company in 1919. It was in Stewart's home business that William's body was hidden following the lynching and where his funeral services were held. The black Masonic hall that Williams had planned on joining was located on Broad Street next to the white owned Benedict's Flores. And like I could go on, um, you ran out further, like how Mr. Stewart had been educated, the places that he worked, the community members that he was associated with, and then also his personal feelings on what he thought was uh, outside interference, like uh, by NAACP uh, Representative Bernard Aids. I just want to speak to uh, the importance of genealogy and the work of genealogy and rebuilding these narratives, because a lot of times you do have to depend on the narratives of other people to tell the story that you want to tell. And so I think as we do um, history, 
that oftentimes genealogy is overlooked. So I'd really like for you to speak to the power of genealogy and how it impacted your work on this book. Well, it was central to my work. And again, it, it stems from my training um, as a doctoral student at Morgan State University, specifically um, my work with Dr. Jeremiah Dubois. I'm gonna give him a shout out. Um, during um, our um, courses, you know, one of the things in terms of our history, histor historiography and methodology course, we talked about using every source possible, right? And, and yet we also discuss how we oftentimes privilege empirical sources, right? And this Western idea of what is, author what is the authority, what is significant, right? And even in writing this book, one of the things that I wanted to make sure that I did was to center the humanity of Matthew Williams and his community, right? Oftentimes, when we think about studies and traditional um, uh, manuscripts on lynching, there um, they speak to political issues in relationship to the violence, which this book does. However, I wanted the focus to be on the humanity and the lived experiences, not only of Matthew Williams. I wanted to center it there, but I wanted to also show the humanity and the lived experiences of those at every um, at every turn who are involved as witnesses, as perpetrators. Um, and so I wanted to be very consistent in that, I think, because, you know, I was really also inspired by Marcus Ridiker's work, believe it or not, the um, slave ship, which talks about moving beyond the ab abstractions and salvaging the humanity of um, the the um, individual. And so that's what I sought to do in this work. And the only way that I was able to do that, as you know, when you're trying to document the lives of black people in this country, because of the nature of archival institutions and the nature of the ways in which we validate and um, venerate in some ways this empirical process and certain types of sources, the written record, for example, um, I had to go to genealogy to salvage the humanity of these victims and create, recreate their lives um, meticulously. And um, listen, I, I went down the rabbit hole um, for nights upon nights because I wanted every individual as much as I can. And if you see the footnotes, um, uh, just a note to potential history PhD students or anyone pursuing history, before you read a book, check out the footnotes. Um, <laughs> but if you look always. at my, listen, <laughs> always. And if you look at my footnotes, you'll be able to see almost every single individual, at least I believe it should be every single individual, there is a census record um, in which I comb through um, and I lay out a brief narrative within the footnotes that articulate um, the, the life of the individual, um, something at least something about their family and about um, their occupation. Um, and I tried to track as many of them as I could, the both victims as well as um, descendants of victims and those who witnessed the lynching, both black and white, but also those who were culpable and complicit in the lynching, right? And so this took a lot more time than uh, traditional research, but that is what, um, ha that's necessary if we're going to be able to really salvage the humanity and of uh, victims as well as communities, right? It's so easy to go the political route. And that's why I'm yes. thankful for my publisher at John Hopkins University for taking my book and not asking me to diminish the humanity of the human story. A lot of publishers could easily say, we want the certain chapters to be more political. How is this related to the overall, you know, but I was very firm in that the narrative will, um, will be consistent and I will make sure to salvage the humanity of every person involved in this lynching and also the victims whose families continue to this day to suffer. Exactly. And um, it, it just speaks to the loss because, you know, we, we know about the loss of life, but I mean, there's been the loss of whole communities. Uh, communities were destroyed in this process as well. So I really thank you for taking that into consideration as you wrote this book. Um, before I move on to my next question, I just want to remind our audience that if they have questions, um, we are taking questions uh, for Dr. Chavis. Please enter them in the Q&A uh, feature here on Zoom. Um, my next question is, you know, you serve as the vice chair of the Maryland Lynching Truth and Reconciliation Commission, and I'm so pleased to serve as a colleague with you on that commission. In your role as vice chair of that commission, did you, did it impact this book in any way? Did you, did it cause you to make changes or reconsider 
how you shaped and framed the story that you were going to tell. Um, please speak to that. Sure. Um, unfortunately, believe it or not, it actually didn't outside of the yeah. um, conclusion in which I articulate the process and how we confront the work, knowing what we know about not only the lynching of Matthew Williams, but um, lynching um, overall as a nation. And so I included that in, within my conclusion. I had to make a revisions there. But the majority of this research and this work had been already completed outside of the genealogical, um, in-depth genealogical work that I wanted to do to salvage the humanity of the victims, but also to identify the um, witnesses, or excuse me, the witnesses and descendants of the witnesses and perpetrators, as well as the descendants of Matthew Williams. And so a lot of the book was already complete. Um, and the research also had been completed for a very long time. And prior mm -hmm. to the existence of the commission, um, and I talk about some of this in the book, um, I discovered these records um, about um, four or five years ago. And yeah. had kept that um, between myself as well as the um, descendants um, who I could identify and local activists in the region. And um, I had been working diligently with the local community as well as the um, descendants to make sure I got this right. Um, and that, you know, this, the truth was laid bare, but in a equitable and in a um, ethical way. Yeah, and I, I have to thank you as a former archivist. Um, you know, many archives across this country, they have vast collections and bare bones staff to really process those collections. And so it's not until historians like yourself come in and glean the records that we discover some of what's in there. And one of the things that I know that you uncovered, um, I believe it was uh, the uh, attorney general's files that you were looking at. Uh, where there were images of people who were involved in these lynchings. Uh, uh, you know, putting faces to names is really just so powerful. And we, we didn't even know something like that existed. So thank you for your work. And I, I just think it's just truly amazing what you were able to uncover in going through those records. Um, before I open it up to the public, um, I do have one last question that I really want to get to the heart of. Um, in light of current dialogues that we have today, both in support of and or opposition to uh, critical race theory, how do you think we can advance the work of truth telling in books like yours and reconciliation and make it actionable for just your basic citizen? Well, I think at first we have to recognize and decide as a public um, you know, who believe in democracy and equity, racial equity, we have to make a decision that we're not going to allow history in this manner, specifically the history of some of the most marginalized and oppressed people within this nation to be politicized, right? And I think we have to make that decision and we have to decide whether or not and when we're going to begin to fight back. Um, because I see critical race theory and the, the um, politicization, politicization of critical race theory as being a Trojan horse of sorts for a real and direct assault on um, the truth um, regarding the ways in which our nation has treated um, black, brown, um, and the most marginalized people within our country, right? Um, and, and we see that evidenced in the legislation that is kind of being birthed out of um, you know, the original demand was to ban critical race theory. And as a former high school teacher, um, you know, knowing the demands of curriculum and knowing what had to be taught, um, I can guarantee the majority of people out there, uh, the majority of teachers who are teaching don't have time to introduce a specific university-based or university-level theory to their students. They're really inter they're mostly interested in trying to get the basics down. And if they're allowed to um, include elements of slave enslavement, or um, lynching, then they'll do that. But their the curriculum is not such in that to that it will allow you to you know to pontificate about a theory, right? Yes. So you know, I think we have to dispel <laughs> that lie, right? That it's like yes. so we we have to let them. You know, one of the things that I ran into when I was teaching at a um, community college in Maryland, I was, we were talking about um, the legacy of enslavement, the history of enslavement, 
And um, I mentioned a number of figures in, who are the most prominent, and we're celebrating the Bicentennial of Harriman Tubman this year. And I began to talk about the importance of understanding Maryland's history and the work of, um, of abolitionism. And the students um, said, what history are you talking about? And I'm like, what do you mean? And I said, you know, Harriet Tubman and Frederick Douglass were from Maryland. And they're like, really? And this was in a community college course. Right? Yes. So we don't have time for critical race theory to be teaching a theory such as this in schools. It's really not being taught. But what we, what we are doing is teaching the truth about our, our um, nation. And that is the larger threat. Right. And we see that in Florida with a number of bills that are emerging that really expose what really was at play to actually um, begin to um, dismantle and disallow the um, teaching of so-called difficult conversations around race and um, and things like that. That is the big assault. It's really assault on truth telling, not so much mm -hmm. on the theory. And as we if we are um, um, smart enough to um, mobilize and recognize that and support um, organizations such as Virginia Humanities, Maryland Humanities, as well as the Riverside Museum um, and the John Mitchell Jr. program at George Mason, um, we have to support these organizations because they are really carrying the banner of truth telling. Um, and, and we that's why the humanities are so important, right? So um, important. So important. Well, I don't want to hog up all the time. I want to open it up for uh, questions. We do have a couple of questions, but there, there's a lot of praise in the uh, Q&A as well for your work. And so I just wanted to share one of those um, first um, from Julie Parson, who says, thank you for writing this book. As a uh, citizen of Salisbury and someone who has researched this case, I was blown away by this book and the details that you uncovered. And I would agree with her wholeheartedly. And now I'm going to move on to a question uh, from Frank Dukes, uh, pronouns he, him. Um, he says, he also, he says, thank you for the book. He, he definitely opens with thank you. A lot of people are really happy about this book. Uh, what are the ongoing impacts that this and other lynchings have on the local communities in which these took place? Well, what, um, thank you so much for your question, Frank. Um, you know, this this lynching had a direct impact on the black community of Salisbury to this day, right? And I, I'm able to document that in the latter part of the book in terms of my conclusion. I work through the um, lingering effects of racial terror lynchings and the ways in which this trauma is um, passed down. But also, um, I lay out um, the case that um, we're currently, uh, that I'm currently working on and and a newer project that maps the lynching of Matthew Williams and makes a direct connection to the dismantling and destruction of the Georgetown community, which where is where Matthew Williams was actually um, born and raised, his community. What a lot of people don't know is that um, the lynching um, actually took place, yes, on the courthouse lawn. However, um, the conclusion of the lynching um, happened at the entrance of the black biz, black business district or black community of Georgetown. And this is where his body was displayed um, subsequently um, to put the black community of Georgetown on notice. And it's very important for us to understand that in 1931, at the time of the lynching, there were around 19 black um, businesses and um, homes. It was a black neighborhood. It was a black business district that were um, still there. To this day, there's only one building that remains of that community, wow. in Georgetown. That's the Charles Chipman Cultural Center, um, at, which is the former church, John Wesley, in which Matthew Williams attended. Um, so all of those buildings, even the bodies in the black cemetery were exhumed. Um, and so when we think about Tulsa and these Rosewood and other you know, massacres, we, we need to look at, in some ways, the state-sanctioned um, systemic assaults um, and destructions of Black communities that are equally as traumatic. Um, and I think part of the work that I'm doing um, in this book and the subsequent work we're doing with national advocacy organizations is to shine a light on these lesser-known cases. Um, and you know the book, as well as evidence that we're uncovering, um, lays out a direct line between the lynching of Matthew Williams and the systemic uh, assault on this community in which 
um, Matthew Williams was directly impacted. Thank you. So our next question is from Janet Johnson, who is inquiring on whether the descendants of Matthew Williams remain in the area. And I don't know that he had any direct um, descendants, but family members adjacent Correct. descendant Correct. communities. Correct. Yeah, so um, he actually had um, collateral descendants. So I, I mm -hmm. use the, so when we think of collateral descendants, of course he, did, he didn't have any children, but we have um, direct connections. And actually the afterward of the book is written by um, one of his collateral descendants, Jeannie Jones, um, her great grandmother was Addie Black, who raised Matthew Williams. Um, and her story is told um, in the Afro American newspaper. And it was around a, a little over a year or so when I worked with a genealogist to uncover and to identify the family. Um, as Maya mentioned, I utilized genealogy in this book. And um, playing an amateur genealogist, I uh, hit a wall, right? And so I said, I need we to all hit walls. <laughs> I'm telling you, right? I said, I need to bring in the professionals, right? Because it's like, there's a skill set. This is a discipline. It should, you know, so um, I contacted a master genealogist, amazing Demita Green, um, who was able to um, tie in all the um, loose ends and connect me directly with the descendant. And this is just to speak to Miss Demita Green's work. Um, who's also a doctoral student at Morgan State University. Demeter Green um, was able to do something that locals and others, even um, national leaders were unable to do um, in, in doing this. And so this speaks to the importance of proper genealogy, genealogy and the importance of genealogists in the work for justice. And so, you know, that, and she got it to me within like a couple months, at least two months during the midst of a pandemic, was able to track down um, the most recent collateral descendant. And so to, I'm kind of long winded, um, but the, the answer no, no, no question, problem. Listen, yeah. <laughs> I think our audience will appreciate your response. Sure, sure. To answer your question um, regarding the family, the, as we know, in most cases of lynching, um, and this was the case for Matthew Williams, one of the reasons why it was so hard for the community to identify family as they begin to do this restorative justice work Right, because um, it's important to understand that the work did not begin with my research. Amber Green, y James Yamakawa, um, and others in Salisbury, Shaney Shields, and others, Sherilyn Eiffel, whose yeah. book I um, honored um, and whose research I build upon, they began shedding light on these cases. Um, and it's very important to acknowledge that. But one of the reasons why they were unable to identify the family is due to what we know about all cases of lynching, right? When we think about and when we teach um, the history of the Great Migration, um, we talk about, right, and this is the more watered down, whitewashed version that we often teach, is that it was about job seeking. Yeah. Blacks were fleeing, but a number of scholars let us know, um, and their work needs to come to the forefront in terms of our curriculum at every level, that lynch people um, fled and left the North and other areas escaping racial terror, domestic racialized terror, right? And that yeah. was definitely the case for um, what we understand for the family of Matthew Williams. Um, some of them um, stayed, um, but um, the family of Matthew Williams, we actually identified them in California. And they had left um, shortly thereafter. A lot of the family had left outside of distant um, relatives to either in the, uh, North Carolina or to Washington, D.C., um, following the lynching, because all, as you can imagine, um, families were targeted directly mm -hmm. following these lynchings. Thank you again. Um, our next question is, and I hope that I'm pronouncing this correctly. Please forgive me if I'm not. I believe the name is Adine Kaylee. Um, and her question is, do you think that there are senses in which labeling present day violence against black individuals as lynching weakens understanding of the horrors of what is usually considered to be lynching in the past? No, I do not. And thank you so much, um, Adine, for that question. I often get it a lot of times. If I'm very careful and within the book, I talk about not getting caught in the trappings of, you know, is this a lynching or is that a lynching? Because it, what it does is it forces us to um, dehumanize the realities of um, anti-Black violence, right? It, it causes us to 
um, overlook the basic um, reasons why lynching, right, is so traumatic, right, and it, it's very basic form. So I don't even. I think it's important for us to really. I don't want to get. I don't like getting in that, that debate around is this a lynching or is this not a lynching, right? And yeah. I talk about that within the book. However, I think it's important for us to understand. And I also am very careful. I use the term modern day forms of lynching. Mm -hmm. right? I don't believe, of course, you know, we have a historical definition of exactly what lynching is, but, and I believe that we should be very direct and clear regarding what is a lynching and what's not a lynching, but I don't think it's worth our time to debate around, because I do think it is re-traumatizing, um, yeah. you know, and I think it speaks to also what I lay out in the book to how, if we're not careful through language, we uh, miss the more important um, story here, right? That a person, a black person, was killed, right, unjustly for whatever reason, right? And so by in debating, you know, the term and what's a lynching and what's not, I don't think it weakens it. I think we have to understand the anti-black violence as a direct line, right? This history, the lynching of Matthew Williams directly when we think about the black consciousness and black people across this country, we don't see them as these one-offs. These are This is unrelenting trauma that our communities have had to grapple with, right? The lack of due process, the, um, you know, when you think about specifically the um, case of Ahmaud Arbery, um, Breonna Taylor, these others, at the end of the day, from Matthew Williams' family to Breonna Taylor's family, their child who was black is no longer with them. Right. And that is a reality and a trauma that black people throughout this country have had to face since we've arrived here. And that's something that um, we have to acknowledge and deal with. Yeah. And we have to sit in as a country. It's, and I think that is the difficult part. We want to um, dismiss these issues as being historical. The lynchings as being historical. These happened so long ago. Okay. Right. And Yeah. Yeah, I, and I'm glad you framed it in that way because I, I think in order for us to identify these modern lynchings as such, we, we do have to kind of do a comparison and contrast and know that it didn't end a long time ago. It just is a continuation. It never stopped. Yeah. And yeah. so um, this list will go on and on and on until we decide as a country that it's no longer tolerable. Um, I, we have another thank you in the chat from Mrs. Nancy Malwitz. She shared that she hasn't read your book yet, but looks forward to uh, reading it soon. Um, mm -hmm. We have two more questions and we have about five more minutes before we wrap up. So I do want to get to those. Um, uh, we have another question from Mr. Dukes. Uh, he said that you're teaching at a state university in which our new governor has called for an end to teaching divisive topics. Will this impact your work in any way? No. Thank you so much for your question, Mr. Duke. But well, <laughs> that's a definitive no. I mean, I think as, a, <laughs> as, you know, as Oprah yeah. Winfrey said, no is a complete sentence and it doesn't require explanation. <laughs> exactly. Listen, we're going to leave it there. Yes. yes. <laughs> and we have um, another question. Uh, do you plan on investigating other cases on the shore like George Armwood or Yo Lee? Um, and they state that Sherilyn Eiffel does a great job of investigating these cases in her book, but I didn't know if you would expand to those two. Yes. So if it's important to everybody, if you can definitely get a copy of the book because what I do in the book, something is very important. And this is something that I did after the fact, like I began to, early on, like a couple of years ago, I began to, um, again, can reflect on the work of Professor Eiffel. And one of the things that she said to the members of the commission when we met um, in Balt at UMB, um, UMD, we, she talked about making sure as a commission that we um, recognize and did not give those who got away with it a pass. And so that stuck into my head, specifically the cases you mentioned, not only the cases of George Armwood and Ewell Lee, but also the cases that are overlooked, the cases, the near lynchings, that amazing scholars like the late Linda Dwyer and others document within the region, that these cases and these stories are salvaged and put in larger context of this overall terror. So yes, we have 40, uh, um, what we think to be 40 additional cases. However, it's also important, and I note this in the book as well, because of the research of Northeastern University, 
um, the, we are now aware of an additional potential 77 cases of racially motivated homicides that not um, are parallel to the commission's date um, charge or task in terms of our scope of 1850s to 1933. These cases are from 1931 to the 70s. So when we think about you know this these lynchings ending, um, the commission has really just uh, begin to scratch the surface, and this research has really begun to scratch the surface. Um, and um, the near lynchings are cases that I document in the region as well as the di additional cases. So I I'll be working with the descendants of Matthew Williams as well as the descendants of George Armwood to um, support their community and their work as well in the Eastern Shore. And as a commissioner, I'm also tasked with supporting the Eastern Shore region overall. And so I work directly with the descendants of Williams and Matt, um, and George Armwood, as well as local leaders there, including a dear friend, Marshall Stevenson, who's at UMES. Yes. Yeah, and we, I, I tell you the thanks and praise for your book. They're rolling in in the question and answer. And I see one from our colleague on the uh, Maryland Lynch and Truth and Reconciliation Commission, Dr. Simone Barrett, who I'm happy is here today joining us, and another colleague, uh, Shakia Gillette Warren, and uh, Mr. Todd Thyberg. And so it's really exciting to kind of see all the thanks. And I'm going to sneak in one more question before we wrap up um, from someone named John Luca, uh, who also starts with a thank you and wonderful work. Um, and John Luca mentions that Tanya Sutherland talks about archival amnesty to describe the role of archives and failing to historically document white supremacist violence and thus pursuing restorative justice. Would you agree that there was a complicity in archival practices, cultures, and covering up lynchings and lynchers and their enablers. Yeah. So we have a couple of minutes. This one has to be a brief response. And I know it's a, a loaded question because I, I, I would love to weigh in this on myself, but I'm going to let you take it away. Yes, I think we do. And I'm so glad for you mentioning the work of um, Professor Sutherland. I think, you know, we have to deal with this because it is something that I saw firsthand going into the Maryland State Archives. And a dear friend of mine who's also a commissioner was there, um, Chris Haley, who is the nephew of Alex Haley. And both of us, you know, I think about this day every time when the book was published, I thought about the, this was the beginning when I discovered these records. Both me and Chris were really awestruck um, seeing that these, some bo these boxes were empty. The original boxes regarding the um, Maryland um, Anti-Lynching um, Commission, these records, um, Interracial Commission had records on the lynching and me and Chris, you know, I called the the um, to get those documents and lo and behold, the boxes were all empty, specifically the years pertaining to 1931 and 1933. And so I asked for Chris to come down and help me figure it out. And both of us were baffled at this. Yeah. Um, and so knowing that and having to deal with that is really speaks to to your point, you know, we have to be able to grapple with this and recognize that um, these, we have to stop hiding this history. That's one of the reasons why we can't really as America deal with um, and reckon with the truth, um, you know, because it's been hidden. And, you know, my work at the end of the day seeks to expose um, the, not only injustices in terms of what exactly happened, but also the injustices that um, were um, that happened in archival institutions and exposed materials, records, and stories that were hidden in full view. And that's one of the reasons why I'm really glad and excited that the National Movement for um, Truth, Racial Healing, and Transformation has decided to focus specifically on Salisbury and the case of Matthew Williams and the lynchings that took place in the Eastern Shore region to utilize this um, example of what exactly um, is at stake here in terms of our history to utilize this region as the their national um, their national pillar to build on their national movement right we know that reconciliation restorative justice it is local um, and um, the goal of this book is not only to speak to the issues that um, are we're dealing with in America but also to support local movements and to expose the injustices that took place at um, our in our back door, at our back door. Yeah. 
Well, thank you so much, Dr. Chavis. And before I close this out, I just want to acknowledge uh, Carrie with the Somerset Lynching Truth and Reconciliation Committee, who also want to thank you for the book and is looking forward to working closely with you, as well as uh, Julie Parsons, who shared that Linda would have loved your book. And I, I think she's referring to Miss Linda Dwyer, who we all loved and respected uh, for her work on lynching. And it was a great loss um, for us to have lost Linda during this pandemic. And she's greatly missed. And uh, she says that she's glad that you were able to collaborate with uh, Linda. So I'm really excited to see that. Um, so now it's time for us to wrap things up. I want to thank you, Dr. Charles Chavis, my good friend. And I want to thank our audience who tuned in as well um, and for your insightful questions. Please consider buying the book. It's an excellent book, a quick read. Um, and it's just so need it in a time like this. Um, and make sure that you reach out to your local bookseller or through the links on the virginiabook.org website. You can also check out future events from the Maryland and Virginia Humanities Councils at their websites, marylandhumanities.org, and that is mdhumanities.org and virginiahumanities.org all spelled out. So we look forward to seeing you at the next program. Thank you. Thank you.